All right, once again, of course, God is great. But Proverbs 26 brings me to a period where I am still trying to get caught up. So let's continue with the theme of sketches, but call Proverbs 26, or at least let's subtitle, sorry, or at least let's subtitle Proverbs 26 hinges, understanding that that term is going to literally come up in one of the lighter hearted Proverbs I think we've come to to this point in this chapter that primarily deals with something we could have really subtitled it as well, and that is folly, understanding that this is an extended discussion of folly, possibly in three forms. One, outright folly in the first section of verses, followed by a type of folly that is marked by either negligence or outright what this chapter is going to call the sluggard in the next set of verses. Then it's going to hinge around a verse that warns against meddling in conflicts you don't understand. At least you don't necessarily understand as well as you should, as it's finally going to talk about a type of folly that is marked by underhanded ways, not necessarily outright wickedness, but something that's going to sound an awful lot like wickedness, a term that's come up, as we mentioned, in previous chapters. However, let's break it down a little bit uh, in the way of a brief sketch of how the chapter is outlined, because in the first, see, 12 verses, almost exclusively, that concept of wisdom is actually going to be discussed in the form of, like we said, outright folly, as in the next few verses, beginning in roughly 13, going through 16, it's going to talk about that recurring theme of money again, but from the perspective of how you don't make it. And that's by being negligent, or as we said, in this case, an outright sluggard. Hinging around verse 17, that warns about the dangers of meddling in conflict as verses 18 through roughly the end of the chapter are going to talk about our recurring theme of righteousness, just from the perspective of unrighteousness or outright shadiness, as we sometimes call it. But uh, let's isolate a few verses from these chapters, understanding that I've given rough sketches. Verses four and five, two relatively famous verses read, answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him yourself. Verse five, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. And there are many different opinions about how this apparent contradiction is reconciled. But before passing judgment on a passage, oftentimes it's helpful to look at it as I've heard a wiser preacher say in the past as a paradox, an apparent contradiction that actually is consistent if you understand the nuance and the way that I have understood this first. Doesn't necessarily mean it reconciles the apparent contradiction, but the way I understand it is in saying that you do not answer a fool according to his folly. It is basically helping you to understand you don't pick up the style in which a foolish person argues. And so when you are confronted by wrath, especially the wrath of a fool, it would be foolish to respond to them in kind or with the same energy that they present to you, understanding that oftentimes fools simply want to provoke. However, it doesn't mean that we simply throw up our hands and bury our heads in the sand and allow fools to rant because there are times when folly unchecked will control the tone of an entire situation and it will spread like a fire. And so understanding when to respond to a fool or how to respond to the foolish according to the ways in which they have a potential to disrupt the peace or the wisdom in an environment is important. But in responding to them according to their folly, it's important to understand likewise how not to respond according to their tone. However, said there is a lighter side to the next set of verses. When in chapter 26 and verse 14, it's going to say, as a door turns on its hinges, so does a sluggard on his bed. That's the title, Hinges, helping us to understand the way in which, as hard as the day may seem, the only way we can truly be about the business we got to get taken care of is to fight that feeling to simply turn on the hinges of our bed. And finally, the thing that stood out to me most from the final section comes from verse 27 and talking about the shady, or at least as we've described them, the shady. When it's going to say in verse 27, once again, whoever digs a pit will fall into it. 
and a stone will come back on him who starts it rolling, helping us to understand that even though it can seem that we spend extended periods of time where people who are doing wrong are winning ultimately, that's all on the clock. Understanding that in life, patience is so important. It's one of those things that folks will often tell you, don't pray for patience because you will often get an opportunity to develop it the hard way. But the hard lesson in life is avoiding the lessons in patience don't necessarily make life any easier. And so if we are going to get through those moments where it seems like wrong is winning, my prayer for you is my prayer for me, that to the degree we are genuinely struggling in him, making him our refuge and not vengeance our refuge, that we hold on to the day that this or another proverb help you to remember that your labor is not in vain.